They're here to present uh, the results of that. Uh, and Matt is here uh, from a transportation standpoint to talk about um, what what we have in place and what um, what we're looking at. Any okay. other questions that you have? Okay. Thank you. With that, gentlemen, what do y'all want to talk about? Just for those who aren't familiar, we, we have radar signs that we've purchased. Can you, can you tell us your name? Sorry, you're um, Yeah, Officer Teske. Thank I'm you. with the traffic unit. Um, and Officer Fleming is also here from the same from our traffic unit. The radar signs we have, we now have four of them. We've got the first two last summer, and we just acquired two more a couple months ago. Uh, the signs that we put up, we can either have them in display mode or stealth mode, so we can either have your speed dis that gets displayed um, or have it hidden. Um, and we can also determine whether or not it flashes, if it's steady or how fast. So it kind of gives some warning. So um, we put up a sign at just north of the intersection of um, on Hamilton, just north of Ferris. Um, we put it up on June 24th and took it down on July 2nd. So it was over nine calendar days. But the day, time we put it up and the time we took it down correspondence was essentially eight full 24 hour periods is what we recorded. Um, there was a total of 13,847 vehicles that were recorded. Um, so that's about what, 1,700 something a day, um, just northbound. Speed limit there is posted 35, um, 7,059 vehicles. Um, just over half of those vehicles were recorded as speeding and that would mean anyone going 36 miles an hour or faster. Um, of all those vehicles that were speeding, 40, just about 4,700 of them were doing one to five over the speed limit. Uh, 2012 were doing six to 10 over the speed limit. There was 254 of those cars that were traveling between 11 and 15 over, so 46 to 50 miles an hour. Um, there was 67 vehicles that were traveling anywhere between 16 and 20 over, so that was 51 to 55. And then there was 30 vehicles that were recorded as traveling at least 56 miles an hour. The peak speed that was recorded was 86 miles an hour. Oh, gosh. Um, the, 80, the average speed of all nearly 14,000 cars uh, was 31 miles an hour. Um, it's pretty typical that your average is about two to four miles an hour below the posted speed limit. Um, and then the 85th percentile, so of all the vehicles, the 85% of the cars were traveling this speed or lower, and that percentile speed was 41. So six over, and Mr. Carpenter can kind of explain you the meaning behind that. That's more of a kind of a DOT traffic engineering number that they look for when they're determining different factors for the roadway. Um, in short, even though, because the, the numbers are pretty big and you're nearly 18, 1900 cars a day, 97.5% uh, of all vehicles were doing 45 or lower. Um, that's actually pretty low. Most time it's about 98 and a half to 99 point something percent uh, doing 10 over or less. And of the 351 cars that were doing at least 46, that basically equates to about 44 violations a day. How about wrecks? Have there been, um, how many wrecks have there been? We have actually pulled up data for there may have been miscommunication for Ferris from Hamilton to Blaine. So it includes this intersection, but also includes the next to east as you're going towards arm um, going towards the park and towards Centennial Street and the Greenway. There was a total of 12 crashes over the last three years in that area. On East Ferris? On East Ferris? East Ferris, the three intersections were East Ferris and Hamilton. Um, they had, I believe it was eight of those were there. Um, there was also East Ferris at Blaine and then East Ferris at Madison, which is the T intersection in between Blaine and Hamilton. Of all those crashes, two were just vehicles actually um, that lost control and just ran off the road, made a wide turn or took the turn too fast. Um, both of those were at Blaine. 
or excuse me, one was at Blaine, the other one was at Hamilton Ferris. One of the crashes of those 12 was actually someone who's parked in their own driveway. Someone else in that household pulled in behind them and then they backed in the car. So that one wasn't even really an intersection, but it it, it comes up when they do the geographical search. (laughs) So take out those three of those nine, they all involved either two cars that just flat out ran a stop sign and the other seven were cars that stopped the stop sign and then pulled out in front of traffic. So there's only two that were actually speed related. Um, and those were both in 2017. Hey Kyle, I've got more crash data uh, up and down Hamilton, so I can add to that. So your speed was at Louise, basically? That's where you were, you were set up at Louise? No, it was just north of Ferris. It was actually the telephone pole right after Ferris. That oh, has, after Ferris towards, yes. towards yeah, Mexico. That way, it, and it started clocking vehicles when after that fork right there at Parkway. Right. It comes over the hill crest, and you're basically bearing around to the left. As soon as you crest that hill, the radar sound was picking up. I think it was, what, like 600-something feet? Yeah. So it's it was uh, picking up cars for probably anywhere from 8 to 10 seconds, and clock on the entire time. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any pictures or diagrams that we can see exactly what you're talking about? I uh, don't. Okay. I'll just yeah. Google map it. It's where Hamilton mm-hmm. crosses First Presbyterian. Hamilton turns yeah. sharp yeah. and down. And back yeah. That's, yeah. That's where they're moving. Yeah. And then you'll have that first is, intersection well, with Ferris. Ferris is much north of that. So, I mean, so you're it's talking the about next it's, it's yeah. starting from that intersection up north past Harris to how far past Ferris to how far north the the sign issues? was less than 100 feet after the oh, intersection okay, okay all right yeah it was literally the next utility pole so you were reading south on Hamilton uh, yeah so it's facing yeah. south so all traffic it only records traffic going towards the sign towards in this okay. case it's a one-way road so there wasn't any traffic that wasn't recorded And then that intersection actually has the stop signs on Ferris and the flashing signal above the roadway. So Hamilton actually sees a flashing amber light uh-huh. when they get to the intersection and Ferris sees a flashing red versus the other side Ferris at Johnson in the historic district, which is the one way going south. That one's a, it's an all way stop. So Ferris and Johnson all get stop signs. And that was probably at least five, six years ago. Five years ago. Are there any questions from Councilman Holmes or Jefferson? No, I I don't have any questions. Actually, yes, I I do have a question. This is Councilman Jefferson. In regards to to these devices that we're talking about right here, um, correct me if I'm wrong, these devices, they're the same ones that they can tell you if you're going too fast of a speed and can also encourage you to slow down. Are, is, is that the same device or are these just those tracking devices that we're talking about? The signs are the ones that say your speed is, and then it has the speed in it. So it records the speed and we can record it to either be a steady number or a flashing number, a slow f- flash or a fast flash, depending on how far over the speed limit you are. There are right. systems that can actually, you can buy, other units that uh, work with these that are actually like your your banners and then you can have slow down too fast and you can have that stuff but this one only displays numbers does it ever track um i guess and, and i don't know if it's possible to track it uh but those drivers who are driving down the road who may be going fast then at a speed or a distance in which is expected for them to see the sign that maybe they slow down when seeing the sign. So that way we can assess whether these do have a traffic calming effect or, or, or is that something that's sort of pie in the sky here? No, it, it, there is some data that we can get from it. The, um, when it starts recording cars, so if say yours was the only car on the road going towards a sign, around that six, 700 feet, it will pick up your car and say you're doing 50 miles an hour, all of a sudden halfway there, you see the your speed is sign and you just lock it up and slow down to 20 the rest of the way, it will actually let you know that the peak speed recorded was 50, but it'll also give, you, give us 
the average speed of your car over that entire duration of time that was being recorded. So the numbers that we gave are your peak speed numbers um, for the actual averages and a little bit of a difference. Let me find it. Like I said, the, the 85th percentile is 41 miles an hour. The average speed ended up being um, 31. So there's where you're gonna get some of your change in there as well is the, the lower speed. It's, uh, here we go. Of the, we did a, ran a uh, weekly report, which only can pick seven calendar days. So we took out the first half day and the last half day and just picked the middle seven. That one showed of the 12,259 vehicles, 6,168 of those vehicles were speeding at some point. Um, 3,000 of them average speeding. So right there you can show that over 50% of those cars actually slow down to the point that their speed over the, that entire six, seven, 100 feet that was being recorded actually fell below the speed limit. So it wasn't even recorded as an average speeding mm. in that area. Okay. So you will see some decrease and then we had 304 cars during that seven days that were reached the peak speed of at least 45, but average, there was only 118 of them. So again, then you're looking at about 65% of those cars. And we attribute that to their, like you just asked, seeing how fast they're going and actually consciously hitting the brake and slowing down to right. lower their average speed that was recorded. So we kind of see that effect with the average numbers would be the same as if one of us was out there in a marked unit and they saw us parked running radar. Right, thank you, thank you. Um, so to follow up that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, there was a device uh, like this one placed on Dayton uh, Street or maybe Dayton Ave, I'm probably getting it wrong, mm -hmm. um, in, in Ward 1. And, and I recall it because some of the residents who live right there were so appreciative of it because they felt that it had a significant traffic calming effect um, as folks were driving down the road, there's actually a home daycare that's there and she felt like the device was slowing things down and, and making it safer for her, uh, her, her children or her students. Um, how long are these devices allowed to stay out on the streets? Are we just using them purely to get an awareness and testing? Might we consider putting some of these devices permanently in places that are historically um, high traffic, high speed traffic areas? Um, most of these were, we've only put out for anywhere from seven or seven or eight days to record data to, I think the longest was when city council had a request for rotary. That one was, I believe, uh, 13 or 14 days. The batteries, according to the program that, or the, the manual is they're supposed to last five to seven days each. There's two batteries inside. So on average, it gives you the 10 to 14 day range. We didn't have the batteries fail with rotary, which was the longest. Um, but essentially when we put these signs up, we'd have to recharge the batteries. There's two batteries that take about six to eight hours each to charge. So when we take these signs down, we basically spend the next one to two days recharging the batteries before they get deployed elsewhere. So there's the, the manpower that would have to be to keep those charged um, and to maintain those. But, the uh, short answer is we use these whenever we have traffic complaints. So when this study was being done on Hamilton, we actually had two on Dayton, um, one to catch eastbound and westbound since that's a two lane road. And then we also had a complaint in a subdivision off of Barrow Road um, for traffic. And we also put one up there, um, but we normally only put these up for about seven to 10 days just to collect the data. And then from that data, then we can focus our efforts on enforcement, either our unit or forwarding on a patrol units, um, or to sometimes with the, when the data comes in, I forward it to uh, Matt Carpenter or Mark McDonald just to let them know, hey, this is the data that we've gotten that may be something you wanna be aware of, and then they can look at it on their end when it looks, when they're considering speed bumps, speed humps, stop signs, lowering a speed limit, that sort of thing. Uh, okay, thank you. And, and guys, forgive me for being verbose. Manager McCaslin, quick question, or, and this, this may be something that's sort of inter-department uh, figurations here, but um, 
I guess measuring this as a viable option for traffic calming compared to some of the other um, options that I know we use. I, I'm not sure where those price points are in comparison. I, I, I get that it takes time to charge and what the manpower looks like, but I'm wondering what the, I, I guess, what our um, costs for doing that compared to the cost of putting in the, the speed bumps and putting in the yield signs and all the other things we use to calm traffic. Do we, do we have any number comparisons on, on, you know, that option of these devices with the manpower to charge versus the other options that we use? Well, uh, Councilman Jeffers, uh, as I was just getting ready to, to uh, relate to the committee, these signs, if I'm not mistaken, cost in the neighborhood about $6,000 a piece. Um, and these are the battery operated signs. I think they are signs that we can get that are, that maybe you could put up a solar panel. The same ones. Same ones. Mm -hmm. Same uh, with a solar panel or mm -hmm. a uh, even direct connect to our electric system. So that is something that could be done. But generally you need in, in most of these roadways, and I let Matt jump in here, you need more than one location. And that's why the speed humps and the other uh, types of traffic calming that we use on a more permanent basis uh, would probably be more effective over the long term. Um, but Matt's getting ready to, to, to speak and I'll let him address that. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Okay, so first thing I would I would like to ask, uh, I think we're probably jumping ahead of ourselves if we're talking about speed humps and permanent uh, fixtures in the roadway at this point. Um, to, to answer a couple of questions that we had earlier, the 85th percentile speed, uh, that is typically what we look at as traffic engineers to see where we ought to set the speed limit. So you don't want to set it too low and create a situation where you've got the majority of the folks violating the speed. In this case, maybe the speed limit is set a little low, but it is a residential area, so 35 is appropriate. And then we would rely on PD to help us out with enforcement. Um, you, you, talk, you ask about crashes. So uh, in the area, uh, Hamilton and Ferris, we've had six crashes over the last uh, three and a half years. Uh, that's 2017 to today, so that's yeah, but that's three three and a half years. Um, at Hamilton and Guilford, we've had four crashes over that same time frame, and Hamilton Louis, uh, yeah, Hamilton Louise, we've had uh, six crashes, so 16 total over three and a half years is not a huge number, but it does raise some raise some red flags, especially we've had some angle crashes here recently that we need to take a look at. I've been out there. To, oh, yes, sir. Can, can you identify yourself for the audience? I'm sorry. sorry. Matt Carpenter. I'm with Transportation Department. Thank you. Um, so I've been out this morning and really have only had about five hours to start really digging into this. So there's going to be more things that we want to look at. But just some general observations that I saw this morning from being out at the intersections. Uh, we've got some site business issues. We've got, um, got some trees that need trimming at all three intersections. We've got the possibility to move an electric pole at Guilford that will help the site distance there. Um, there's some cars parking different places that we might could adjust the, the no parking zone to, to help that. And I would recommend doing all of these things and then evaluating it for a period of time before we talk about doing anything permanent. Um, the other thing that I will say is that we've looked at over time on Johnson Street, um, we've had numerous complaints over there. We put in the three-way stop at Ferris, I think four years ago now, and we have seen a, a decrease in crashes at that location. So that could be a potential option for a three-way stop at Ferris and Hamilton. Again, we'd like to continue to, to look at it. Uh, one thing that we know is coming up on Johnson is that uh, they're gonna resurface next year. And our plan, our plan at this point is to reduce Johnson Street between Lexington and Parkway from two lanes southbound to one lane southbound with parking on both sides. So that will, we think that will help some of the speeding because if you have a platoon of vehicles moving through there and the lead car is only doing 30 miles an hour, well then that means everybody's doing 30 miles an hour. So that will help that. That is a potential for Hamilton as well. Uh, we don't necessarily need two lanes of traffic through there. Uh, maybe some additional parking on both sides of the road would help the speeding. We, we just, we, we'd like to take a look at that. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's pretty much what I have if you have any other questions. Chairman Hudson, I'd love to, to make a point of clarification to Mr. Carpenter's initial remark about getting ahead of ourselves. To my inquiry about these devices being used as a permanent fixture or measure for traffic calming, it was not in response to, to this study about this specific street. I think I was just curious about what its viability was from a financial standpoint um, to see if it might ever be considered in the future. As a junior councilman, only being eight months in, these are still the questions I asked. So I apologize if it was interpreted in the wrong way. Mr. Understand, Robert. no no foul, no foul, no harm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, the, the, the one thing I would add to that, <coughs> excuse me, um, is that devices like this tend to lose their effectiveness over time. Uh, people get used to it, especially with, with signage. We see that a lot is, I've had it happen so many times that I, that I have to remind someone, the sign's already there. And, they're, and they ask me, well, I've driven past that intersection 15 times. I've never seen that <laughs> sign. And they go back the 16th time and they go, oh yeah, it's there. It's been there for <laughs> 10 years. So yes, there's some, there's some short-term uh, impact that is, that, is, that is positive, but then the long-term you see that effectiveness drop off. So. We saw that at Rotary an awful lot. Yeah. Put a sign up and things slowed down for a day and you took right. them off and it was the next day right back up. I will comment, coming down Hamilton, the, the parking, the on-street parking on Hamilton is obtrusive at, least, at best, it's in the way. Uh, especially where the two roads come, you have a merge plus on lane on, on street parking right there. If, if there's a way to let the merge happen separate from merging into another lane, if you make Hamilton one lane right there that becomes two lane again, that's a problem intersection. But the on street parking right there at Louise. Um, I, yeah, I'm not sure exactly where the no parking zone is in there. I know there is one as you, yeah. as you, as you go around that it's curve. The right, it's the right hand side and there's parking on the left. There's always, yeah. there's always cars on that left hand side. Most of those houses don't have a lot of right. you know, parking. So describe for me what you're talking about one more time. I'm a little fuzzy. Where? What's so as you go around the curve, as you go in yeah. northbound, you've got two lanes that go around right. that S-curve. You have two lanes that go around and yes. one lane that merges in. Yes, that's coming in from the left. Yes, correct. That lane, that merge lane goes into another lane as you're making an S turn. So yes. you have a merge right in an There's, S yes. that picks up on street parking <laughs> as soon as those two merge together. So yes, I, mean, I, it's a, I it's will. A tough, little, tough. I will agree that is not the greatest design ever. Yeah. Um, that is what we had to work with in the right of way that we had available. So, yeah. Any any other comments, questions? So what you would like to do is, is investigate the three options that you had mentioned. Well, we, yes, we, we, need, we need to get out there and talk to these neighbors and get some trees trimmed. Okay. Um, and then we need to probably adjust some no parking zones, like you said, maybe at the Norton, maybe at the South End down there, you know, past Louise and definitely at Ferris and possibly at Guilford. Um, and then beyond that, I'd like to see if those changes have a positive effect. Um, so, yeah. I think that's, that's good. Do you need do you need action from us to do that, or no, is that that's just in house? That's typical. That's what we do. Okay. So yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Any any questions, Councilman Holmes and Jefferson? Um, no, uh, just just one. Um, the deployment of these um, of these uh, sensors uh, are they can they be requested, or is it something that says internal study done by traffic volume or accidents? Or uh, is it possible for a citizen or neighborhood to, to request these um, if, if they feel like they would like to have one in the area? Um, we do it both ways, um, but generally we've uh, deployed the signs based on complaints. Mm -hmm. um, the one on South Road that we just did a couple weeks ago, that was a single citizen that called in to complain. We didn't have our signs deployed anywhere. So I put them up there for their um, eight day study. Um, so it generally it comes in through a citizen complaint. Um, some of these intersections where we've put up the signs have been historically areas where we've had a problem with speeding. I know Aberdeen Road was one that was not complaint based, but we knew of that area. So we had put a sign up there when we initially got it. Um, so sometimes it's based on the data that we're seeing or crashes 
Um, Dayton, actually, we put those signs up after there's the fatality um, uh, the month before. Um, so we put those signs up and even though that traffic fatality was due to a stop sign violation, not speed related, because there was a crash in that area and there had been some history of speeding there, we deploy those signs and that was without um, a citizen complaint. But yes, yeah, citizens can call in to complain. Um, generally, they'll speak to Lieutenant Abernathy, who's our supervisor of the traffic unit, and then he'll relay to us where to put the signs if there's any, if there's multiple complaint areas, we'll just deploy them based on priority um, for those signs. Does that so, answer for the question? Long, the, the long-term collection of the data and the study, um, what, what is the, the logical move after that? Say, for instance, you find um, from a, a deployed unit that you have a significant traffic, um, you know, traffic situations, is that then how you would go about assigning, you know, speed bumps or things like that to an area to, to have a long-term solution? Because I, I imagine that these signs aren't viewed as a long-term solution to, to traffic issues. For the police department, we use this data to determine our enforcement efforts. So okay. we also get time frames too. Generally, the, most of these have come out your rush hours, your morning, afternoon rush hour, and then your lunch hours. But sometimes we've gotten the complaints or we've gotten the data in a specific period of time. So we can actually focus our enforcement during those times. Um, it also gives us a way to basically monitor everyone 24 hours a day when sometimes because of call volume, we may only be able to focus for one or two hours a day or an hour every other day to try and catch speeders or to figure out if there is a speeding problem. So that helps us there. As for the speed humps and long-term stuff, um, that would be something Matt Carpenter will get answered here. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Matt Carpenter again. Um, yes, we would use the speed data that they collect in, in the different, in, we, we, I know we've deployed them in residential areas to collect speed data and there is a part of our traffic common policy that deals with speed. So yes, they are using evaluation for those kind of devices. Um, does that, does that pretty much? Yeah, no, no, that, no, that's exactly the, the, the question I had. I didn't, cause you know, in, in data collection, it's, it can show different things to different departments. And I was just wondering if you uh, were sharing the data that you collected uh, with transportation to be able to, um, you know, speed up the, the, the time it takes to determine where traffic calming needs to happen around the city. So uh, that's exactly the question. That's exactly the answer I was looking for. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, again, this is Matt Carpenter. Uh, we, we work with PD uh, pretty well on that. They share that information quite frequently with us. And we're also able to request where those signs go. So if we see a problem, we're able to request them to put up signs as well. So it's not just citizen complaint. Great, great. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just, this is Randy McCaslin. Just, just uh, as a point of information, in talking with the uh, transportation director yesterday, he, uh, he, he had a previous uh, appointment, couldn't be here today. But he just wanted the committee to know that, that there is about uh, five or six active petitions right now for traffic calming devices. And it looks like that most, if not all of those are going to, are going to qualify for that. So um, uh, we've got a lot in the pipeline right now that are coming to some of these neighborhood, uh, uh, neighborhoods that have been uh, complaining about speeders for some time. And would that come through p &L? Uh, well, you've already budgeted uh, as part of your annual budget. Uh, I think it's hundred thousand dollars for for that purpose. And as long as we're able to uh, to get, if they qualify based on the policy that you've adopted, and um, and we've got funding for it, we'll move forward with that. Now, at a hundred thousand dollars, probably what we'll do is group them all together and try to do them under one contract. So a $100,000 contract would come back to the finance committee for approval, uh, but it's because of the, uh, the size of the contract, not necessarily the individual. If it was a smaller contract, say $60,000 or something like that uh, for one or two projects, 
then that wouldn't come back to finance. We would just move on, on forward with the projects because it's in accordance with the policy that you've already adopted. Okay, so just for instance, and not to take away from uh, Hamilton, but you know, I'm dealing with Kensington currently. Is that right. one of the that ones? One of okay, yes. all right, That's great, perfect, right. perfect. Yeah, I just, and this was just a not policy that information, that, so yeah. thank you. This is a policy the PNL created two years ago and we adopted. So it's, I mean, we can always revisit the policy, but it's already in effect. So it's self-fulfilling. Perfect, they'll, they'll yay. According okay. to how, how the policy uh, states. So there's two other brief things I would like to bring to your attention for a little later. One is I would like for us to look at our special events policy and Councilman Holmes and Jefferson, I'll put these in your mailboxes. And all I want you to do is look at this policy and come back to the next meeting with an idea of a definition of the policy that you would like to see. Because at, at the moment, we don't have a definitive policy of how we decide what is co-sponsored and what is not. It's left up to the discretion uh, of the committee. And I'd like us to get a little bit more uh, firm in our policy of this is what we do support, this is what we don't support, so that, so that there's no conflict of interest and there's no conflicts between the nonprofits that basically do the same thing. So that we're not supporting one and we are supporting another. So I'd like for you to think about uh, coming up with a firm policy of how we designate what co-sponsored is. The other thing is we had talked in our last meeting about uh, creating a subcommittee to discuss and to get moving on our downtown marketing and branding uh, initiative that we had talked about during our retreat. And uh, Mr. McCaslin and Mayor and myself have come up with a list of people that we would like to be on that committee and I'm running it past you for information as well as for you to tell me if there is anyone else you think should be on this committee and you don't have to do it now. You can email me and we can talk about it, but I would like this committee to be composed of Councilman Holmes, to be chair of that subcommittee and to, uh, to be the reporting uh, Councilman back to the PNL committee, like Greg Ferguson to serve on that as well and then have a representative from Forward High Point which would be Ray Gibbs since he is up forward high point, uh, a representative from market authority, one from the CVB and one from the chamber of commerce. And I'd like to keep this subcommittee no more than eight people simply for, for <laughs> the fact that I don't want it to get so big that it becomes laden down with, with uh, discussion. Um, we're, we're still at the early phases of this and I'd like to get something rolling. So those members I would like to, to begin on this committee. And if you'd like to add, or have ideas, email them to me, and I'm happy to happy to talk about it. But that's where the, that's how the committee will stand as as it is, and we will work in the next month to get that committee meeting and up and rolling, and, and uh, should have a report to you two meetings from now. Yeah. Well, as a BSBA in marketing, I'd love to be on that committee as well. And I'm okay. on Forward High Point. I'm the liaison, and so. Anything from Councilman Holmes and Jefferson? Uh, no, just uh, uh, happy to uh, be involved. Uh, one one final question um, for either um, the officer or, or Mr. Carpenter. In, in terms of process for the uh, traffic uh, signals, um, signage, I'm sorry. Uh, is there a formal process that for the public to be able to actually um, uh, request this or is it just calling in to either the police department or to um, the transportation department to get that? Is there a link on the website that, that the public can use um, that they can get this, uh, request one of these uh, sensors to be put in the neighborhood? Right now there's no link on the city website. What we're in planning right now is trying to figure out how to get a link onto the city's website as well as to make our one page reports, the numbers I read you, uh, public information that way anyone can go in and just pull up the results of the, the traffic study. Right now, people either do one of two things, they'll either call the police department um, on the main number, the 7940 number, and get referred to Lieutenant Abernathy. They'll either reach him or they'll reach his voicemail and he'll forward it on to one of us to put up myself or Officer Fleming. Um, or if they call the non-emergency number, they will get, uh, or officer will answer, 
or get assigned the call or if traffic's unit is or traffic is working one of us will get the call if we're not working the officers will put it on our internal blog of the traffic complaint which uh, we look at and lieutenant abernathy reads every day so one way or the other we will get the complaint to us but there is no standard form or any practice that they have to do they can just contact the officer and complain either to the police department directly or via the non emergency number for a patrol officer thank you very much yes sir Chairman Hudson, to the point sure. of the uh, marketing committee, I, I appreciate the efforts that you guys have taken on that, and, and I certainly feel that that my counterparts in Councilman Holmes and Councilwoman Peters will do a phenomenal job serving um, as, as the conduits between our governing body and, and that group as it looks to figure out what this looks like. I am excited for the fruition of this work. Um, I, I do want to ask a few questions. I, I heard mentioned that uh, Assistant Manager Ferguson, it sounds like he'll be the only City of High Point staff member on that group. Um, and, and as I understand, uh, providing the oversight for our communications public engagement department, that would be the natural fit. Um, and it, Bob, I would also encourage us that um, in, in that department, whether it's Director Hollis or our marketing manager, Ryan, Ryan Ferguson, those are both um, individuals and professionals from my time seeing who do a phenomenal job of already looking at everything that the city does to market. Uh, so it may just make us a little more efficient and a little more time savvy to have at least one of those involved in that effort. Um, so that way, all of the discussions and stuff, it sort of saves time as opposed to always having to go back to say, here's what we talked about and then asking them to work on stuff. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's all types of ways to work to, to work that out. So Chairman Huss, I'm, I'm, that, that's something I'd, I think it's worth considering. The other thing I think is worth considering is that we mentioned a number of entities and institutions who will partner with us on this effort. I think um, within that effort, an institution that should be just as big as any other is High Point University. I did not mention, and I did not hear any representation from them. I think that uh, Dr. Cubain and his team have done a phenomenal job in marketing our city to students and families and other folks from throughout the not just the country, but the world, and telling our city story. And I think that they should be as much a part of that as anyone else. Council, Councilman Jeffers, this is Randy McCaslin. Uh, I have already talked to Jerron about being an advisor to this committee, and he is uh, he has gladly agreed to do that. Thank you for the clarification. Perfect. Well, God. <laughs> <laughs> Anything further, Councilman Holmes or Councilman Jefferson? No, that's it for me. Thank you. Anything That's else it. from the floor? If not, we're adjourned. Thank you all. Thanks.